Let me begin. Uh, the uh, I'm going to try to be a little more interactive today. So if I ask questions, uh, I will expect somebody to respond. Now, if this were the regular classroom, I'd be I'd be uh, uh, I'd be pointing at people and asking questions. I, can't, I obviously can't do that over here. So you're going to have to volunteer. Okay. Now, let me begin. In the next couple of lectures, we are going to be looking at Hopfield networks and their uh, and their uh, follow-up model, which is the Boltzmann machine. Now, okay. So so far, here are the kinds of networks that we've seen. We've looked at neural networks which perform computation. So all of the networks have been strictly feed-forward models. You start off at some, you, ha you have some input. The input goes into some subset of, some set of neurons. Then those, the, the uh, values computed by those neurons feed to the next layer and those values feed to the next layer and so on till you compute the output. Now, once any neuron has processed a particular input, that input, it, it doesn't revisit that input again. The, in that the information keeps flowing down the net till it goes outside. Can you see the mouse? Guy? Yes. Okay, good. All right. So uh, now, so in these networks, there is no loop back. The information that goes out of a, a neuron doesn't go back into the neuron, right? But today we're going to start looking at a second type of network, which is the one below in the slide, where when a neuron has done computing some output, for uh, a given input, it isn't actually done because that output is fed to some other neuron, for example, over here. And, and once the second neuron has done processing it, the output of that neuron can now go back and come back to the uh, original neuron itself. So now you have these loopy structures where the information sort of rings around in the network. So here is a cleaner representation. Uh, in this example, I have five neurons. Observe that the output of any neuron goes to every other neuron. So, so uh, if you consider the neuron to the left that I'm pointing to with the mouse, once it, once it uh, operates on an input, its output goes to each of these other neurons down, down these arrows. <clears throat> and their outputs in turn come back to this neuron. So again, you can see that you have these loops and uh, the information sort of uh, keeps ringing around in the network. So these are the kinds of neurons that we're going to see. Specifically, we're going to be considering a very particular kind of activation function, where the activation function is of the form theta z shown to the left, where if the, if the affine combination coming into the neuron is positive, the output of the neuron is plus one. If it's, non, if it's negative zero or negative, the output of the neuron is minus one. Again, we're using a plus one, minus one for output, not a zero one, okay? So, but this is still just a threshold activation. And again, you can see that every neuron receives input from every other neuron and every neuron output signals to every other neuron. So you have this uh, cyclic uh, passage of information. Now, specifically, we're going to focus on a particular kind of model, although this, uh, the kind of the assumption we're making here is not mandatory. Uh, for simplification, we will assume this kind of model where the weight with which neuron I gets information from neuron J is the same as the weight with which neuron J gets uh, values from neuron I. So Wij equals Wji. These connections are symmetric. Now, this network is what is called a Hopfield network. Here's how this neuron, uh, this network would operate. Now, consider any particular neuron the neuron would receive a weighted combination of the outputs of all of the other, other neurons plus a bias, which is, what, which is this affine combination we're seeing to the top right. This is what we will call the field at the neuron. It is the total influence of all the other neurons at this neuron. So at each time, each new neuron receives a field. Now, if the field is positive, the neuron's output is going to become plus one. If the field is negative, the neuron's output is going to become minus one. Now, consider what happens 
because the because the neuron keeps changing uh, changing its output now consider what happens if the output of the neuron is currently plus 1 and the field is also positive because the field is positive the output will remain plus 1 similarly if the output of the neuron is currently minus 1 and the field is negative the output of the neuron will remain minus 1 on the other hand if the neuron's current output is plus 1 and the field is negative now the neuron must go to the output must change from being plus 1 to minus 1 so in other words the output has flipped similarly if the output is currently negative minus 1 and the field is positive then the output must change from going from being minus 1 to being plus 1 again the output flips so the overall behavior can be sort of summarized as what is given in the second bullet if the sign of the field matches the outside the sign of the output of the neuron itself the neuron doesn't do anything because the uh, output is in conformance with the field if the sign of the field is different from the current output the output will flip so uh, this you can summarize the whole thing like so the uh, uh, if the current output is y and the field which is this affine combination is given by this guy this term with the parentheses if both of them have the same sign their product is going to be positive if both of them have opposite signs their product is going to be negative so the neuron will become flip itself so y is going to become minus y if the product of y and the field is negative this is the behavior of the network right so a neuron flips if the weighted sum of other neurons outputs is of the out opposite sign to its own current output value but then what happens when this neuron flips something strange happens this guy uh, so let's say you have uh, neurons in this current state i have some example values below but when i tested them out the values are wrong so i'm going to have to fix this uh, figure and i've had this erroneous figure for many semesters so this clearly needs a fix but here is the situation right let's say i initially set the neurons in the state now this black neuron over here is going to receive a total field from all of the other neurons if the total field is of a different sign from the black neuron that black neuron is going to flip and change its value now when the black neuron flips and changes its value now consider this neuron to the top that neuron has a total field and if the total field is is different from the uh, sign of the output of the neuron itself that neuron too will flip but now because these other two neurons have been have been flipped the field at this first neuron at the bottom that is going to change and this may cause the first neuron to flip so you can see how the behavior uh, progresses every neuron is going to cause an or cause yeah, cause a part of a field at other neurons which may cause those neurons to flip but when those neurons flip yeah what's the question uh i had a question about how the ordering is done how do you choose which order to uh proceed in we will get there we will get there right it's not about the, it's uh, you don't even have to think about it in terms of order you can think of them as all of them all of them as operating simultaneously right okay every neuron is going to get some field at itself at the current instant it's going to try to align itself with the field but when that happens it's going to change the field uh, at the other neurons which may flip and so the whole operation can keep on continuing so here is a here is how the whole thing behaves if the sign of the field at any neuron opposes its own sign it flips to match the field which will change the field at other neurons which may then flip which may cause those other neurons including the first one to flip and so on and so the whole thing can continue in a loopy manner so here is a little simulation where i have a loopy network uh, i have uh, set these weights randomly and uh, i initialized all of the neurons at some value and then just let it evolve and you can see how they, they go on flipping here i stopped it after 20 evolutions after 20 neurons had flipped but then i have a longer simulation over here 120 evolutions and they keep on and, and as, as you can see they keep changing right every neuron is causing other neurons is, is influencing the uh, behavior of the other neurons and cause them to may cause them to flip but when they flip they may change the field of the current neuron causing the current neuron itself to flip and this behavior can continue now here is a question to you guys right 
will this behavior continue forever? How many of you guys think that a situation such as this is going to keep on, is going to continue, and this is going to be an infinite loop? Opinions? Raise your hands. If you think, raise your hand if you think this is going to continue forever. Right. So, and how, quite a few, right? And how many think it will stop at some point? So those who have raised your hand for the continuous behavior, just lower your hands. And how many think it'll, it'll stop at some point? That's called, so that has a larger number, right? So it's actually going to stop. And I'll show you why it will stop. Just switch off your raise hand. Uh, so let's look at how this neuron actually, this, this network behaves, right? Now, the field at any neuron has some sign. If the current output has the same sign as the field, the output is not going to change. If the field is of a different sign from the current output, the output is going to change. Now, at each neuron, let y minus be the output of the neuron just, just before it responds to the current field. And let y plus be the output of the neuron just after it responds to the current field. Now, if y minus the is the same as the sign of the field, then the neuron is not going to flip. So y minus is going to be the same as y plus, right? Now, if I look at the product of y and the field at the neuron, so the product of y and the field after it has responded minus the product of the output and the field before it has responded is going to be zero in this case because y and the field had the same sign. So the neuron didn't flip. y plus is the same as y minus. These two terms are going to be the same. And so this term did not change, right? But now consider the other case. Consider the, key, consider the case where the field is of an opposite sign from the output of the neuron. When the field is of an opposite sign, then if y minus is the output of the neuron just before response, and y plus is the output just after response, y plus is going to be, is, the neuron is going to flip, and so y plus is going to be minus of y minus, right? And something else, once the neuron flips, the neuron is going to align itself with the field, right? So once it flips, y will have the same sign as the field. So the product of y and the field is now going to be positive. Before it flipped in this case, y was the opposite sign as the field. So the product of y and the field was going to be negative, right? So if I take the difference between the product of the output and the field after response and the product of the output and the field before response, this is y times field, y plus times field minus y minus times field, because y, y minus is simply going to be minus of y plus. This is just going to be two times y plus times field. And this term is always going to be positive. Now, without even looking at the arithmetic, you can see that this first term is guaranteed to be positive. The second term is guaranteed to be negative, but then you're subtracting it. So the result is going to be positive. So that this difference will always be positive when the neuron flips. And this difference is going to be zero when the neuron does not flip, right? Now consider this term over here, the sum of the output of the neuron and the field, I mean the product of the output of the neuron and the field summed over all of the neurons in the network. I can sort of write this whole thing as a, as a simple uh, combined equation, which is the double sum over all pairs of neurons, where you don't consider, uh, you know, where you don't consider uh, i equals j. So because you're assuming that there is, that a neuron doesn't influence itself, then you're going to get the, the sum over all pairs of neurons of the, of wij times y i y j plus, this term over here, which is a sum over all neurons of the product of the output of the neuron and the bias, right? So just consider this term. Now, if any neuron flips, 
then, th so this term is simply going to be the sum of these guys over here on top, over all the neurons. And we know that if I look at this D term after a neuron has responded, and if I look at the D term before a neuron has responded, for every single neuron that flips, that contribution to this difference is going to be positive, right? So uh, if you consider just a single neuron, the uh, change in D because one neuron flipped, say the kth neuron flipped, is simply going to be yk plus minus yk minus times the field of the kth neuron, right? And this term is guaranteed to be positive. If multiple neurons flip, every one of them is going to make a, a positive contribution to this delta D. So which means that this D term, which you've written over here, whatever it may be, which is the sum over all the neurons of the product of the output of the neuron and its field, every time the neurons flip, that D is going to increase, right? Is this clear to everybody? Any confusion? If there's any confusion, raise your hands. Yeah, Roman? Uh, professor, I have a question regarding slide 18. Uh -huh. uh, in the last line, it says every flip of a neuron is guaranteed to locally increase that much. I mean, but that is not true for the last case that we saw, right? If the output is the same. So uh, it's oh, correct. Every flip, if the output is the same, there is no flip. Oh, got it. Sorry. Correct? Yeah. Right. So basically, anytime neurons flip, D is going to increase. Otherwise, D is going to stay the same. Right? Mm -hmm. Now, you. so look at this. Here is the D term. Okay. D is the sum over all neuron pairs of W times YI, YJ plus this sum over all neurons of the product of the output of the neuron and, and the bias. Is D, does D have an upper bound? Anyone? How many of you think it's unbounded? Raise your hand. So how many of you think it's bounded? Pretty much everybody, right? Simply because you're summing a finite number of terms. And the y's are guaranteed to be either plus one or minus one, right? So the upper bound on this is on this first term is simply going to be the sum of all the weights. The upper bound on the second term is simply going to be the sum of all the biases. This whole term is bounded, which means that this D term has an upper bound, right? And when things flip, each time a neuron flips, the change in D is going to be two times the field magnitude of the field of the neuron. This two we know, correct? So this means that D has an upper bound and changes in D have a lower bound, right? Which means that the number of times D can change before it hits the max is going to be bounded, correct? Everybody see that? I guess so. So in other words, they must, they, this entire operation is going to stop in a finite number of steps. And so to con continue this idea, I can now introduce the notion of the energy of the network. The energy of the network, we'll come to where this term energy comes from in a few minutes. The energy of the network I will define just as the negative of this term D, right? It is minus of the sum over all pairs of neurons of W times WIJ times YIYJ minus the sum over all neurons of Y times B. And every time this network, which is a Hopfield network as we defined, as we, as we uh, defined, uh, every time it evolves, every time a neuron flips, this E is going to decrease because D is the, neg e is the negative of D. Remember D was increasing. So every time, the network evolves, E is going to decrease, okay? So here's the story so far. A Hopfield network is a loopy binary network with symmetric connections. Every neuron in the network attempts to align itself with the sign of the weighted combination of outputs of other neurons, which is the local field. Given an initial configuration, if I just set all of the neurons at some initial configuration, the neurons in the network will either flip 
will, will, will begin to flip to align themselves to their field. But when they do, do so, this, will, this causes the field at other neurons to change, potentially making those flip, right? Which can in turn cause the original neuron to go back and flip. Every evolution step of the network is guaranteed to decrease this energy term that we defined for the network. The energy is lower bounded. The decrements are also upper bounded. So the network is guaranteed to converge to a stable state in a finite number of steps. So where did this term uh, energy come from? Remember, here's how we define the energy, right? Which is the negative of the uh, sum over all pairs of neurons of the weighted uh, product of their outputs minus the sum over all neurons of the product of the output and the bias. We call, it a, call this an energy. And we said that the evolution of the network constantly decreases the energy. Where did this strange energy concept come from? It turns out that this model that we have is actually, uh, it, it's very similar to a very well-known model in physics called the Ising model. Now consider, yeah, go ahead. There are some questions. Guys, start. What's the question? Um, yeah. yeah uh, professor, about the model that we are discussing, I was wondering uh, which, like, if every node is similar, then which node do we take an output from? So you can take any, at any point you can sample, you, you can look at any output neuron, right? We're just speaking of the overall evolution of the network. So if I had to write, if I had a, too bad I don't have a pen and paper. Let me see if I can pull up a, uh, gosh, this is going to be, If this is a bit of a problem because I can't pull up a whiteboard while uh, explaining. But think of uh, arranging all of the neurons. Think of this as one layer in a network, correct? So if the layer is connected to, it, and think of the current state of the network as one layer of a layered network and the, uh, and the state of the network immediately after response as the next layer of the network. In between, you have the weights, correct? Yes. And so basically, this network, you can think of this as an infinitely deep network where every the weights at every layer are identical. Okay. Make sense? Yes. Right? And so a loopy network can be unwrapped in this manner. And what we are saying is that the maximum depth, there is a maximum depth to this network after which adding more layers doesn't make any sense. Yeah, okay. Did that make sense to everybody? I guess, no raised hands. Okay, so let me go back and explain where this notion often, yes. What are the questions guys? I have a couple of raised hands. Questions? Okay, no, all right. So uh, now, where did this concept of an energy, once you've raised your hand, please lower it because it causes confusion. So uh, the uh, where does this concept of an energy come from? It's a physics phenomenon. Now, in a dielectric material, every, a, every little molecule is basically a dipole and these dipoles have a direction. They have, they have little magnetic fields. And now at every molecule, right? At every dipole, there is a local field, which is the result of the magnetic influences from all the other dipoles in the material. And each dipole is going to try to align itself with the local field so that not, so that not the, uh, the, you know, north points to, uh, North aligns itself with North and South aligns itself with South, right? So, but then if the dipole is currently not aligned and it flips itself, this is going to cause the field at the other dipoles because this is the magnetic moment, right? So the magnetism changes, it's flipped its direction. This causes the field at the other dipoles to change and those dipoles may flip and the whole process may go on. So this is just a standard physics process, physics, uh, uh, you know, uh, physical model, which actually uh, which is actually observed. 
And this model is called the Ising model. It's a model for magnetic materials, Ising and Lens 1924. Now let P be the vector position, position of the ith dipole. Then the, the field at the dipole is going to be a weighted combination of the magnetic moments of all the other dipoles plus any external magnetic field that you might apply. So the total combination of contribution of all the other dipoles is what is called the intrinsic field. And then you have the external, external field. And uh, now the, and the contribution of any dipole to the field at any point depends on this interaction term over here, which depends on the uh, dielectric constant of the material, the distance, and a bunch of other factors. Now, what happens is that at each dipole, you have a total field and the current dipole is going to stay itself if the current dipole is aligned with the field. Otherwise, it's going to flip. X is going to become minus X if the current dipole is of opposite sign from the field. So a dipole flips. If it is misaligned with the field and its current location. And of course, as a result, the flip dipole will change the field at other dipoles, some of which will feel flip as a result, which can change the field at the current dipole, which may flip, and the whole thing is going to go on. Now, when will this whole thing stop? It turns out that these are all, you know, uh, we're all familiar with uh, at least with the physical properties of various materials. Here's what happens. Uh, what happens when you leave a hot object on a, uh, you know, on a table? It's going to cool down. What, what is happening in the process? It's actually losing energy, right? So all objects like to settle down in some kind of a minimum energy configuration. This is one of the laws of physics. And so for these materials, you can define something called the Hamiltonian, which is basically, uh, there's this minus, this is half as a scaling term. This is uh, one of the conventions of physics, but at each point, every dipole is going to contribute something to the potential energy of the system, which is the product of the moment of the dipole itself and the field. This, we've all seen this in, you know, in our classes in physics, the product of the local, local mag magnetic moment and the external field at that point is the potential energy over there. You sum it over all of the uh, dipoles. And if I just expand it out, that's given by this term over here, the, the sum, the minus of the sum over all pairs of dipoles of the product of the values of the dipoles and the constant by, by, by which they're connected minus the contribution of the external field. And the system is going to evolve. Each flip is going to minimize the energy. And the dipoles will stop flipping if there's any flips result in an, in an increase in energy. So basically they're going to keep flipping this is going to look, this, this is going to result in a system with reduced energy. And how, where is that extra energy going away? It's going to be released as heat. This, this happens. We've observed this and this is, uh, this is the basis of so many uh, different properties, different processes that we follow in, uh, in uh, physics, including when you're trying to anneal materials and so on, right? So the system is going to have, if you plot this the overall potential energy of the system, against the state of the system. By the state, I mean it is the, the, the state of the system is, uh, is basically the state of all of the dipoles in the system. I can represent it as a vector. So if there are n dipoles in the system, I'm going to have an n dimensional vector. Every dimension, every component is going to be either plus one or minus one, depending on which way it's pointing. And obviously this is a vector in some n dimensional space. So you can't just, uh, I know, lay them out sequentially like I've drawn in the figure. So this is only for the purpose of illustration. But you're going to have a state of the system. And if the system is initially set at some configuration, it will have some potential energy. It's going to begin evolving until it arrives at a state which, where, at which the potential energy is a local minimum. At this point, any local change of any of the dipoles is going to result in an increase in the energy and the system is not going to Therefore, it's not going to change from that point on because it's always trying to evolve towards a, a, a minimum energy configuration, right? So here's something else. Suppose if you think of this minimum energy configuration, 
as uh, a st if you if you consider this minimum energy configuration, right? What happens if you actually start from this configuration and perturb some of the dipoles so that they change their values? So if I assume you can see my mouse. So if the system is currently over here in this state with this uh, with uh, this energy, and then if you perturb some of the dipoles so that the system changes to this new state out here where the energy is up here, it's going to begin to evolve and it's going to go down, go down the slope till it ends up in this valley again, which means that you can think of this as the system as remembering the stable state. You put it in a stable state, it remembers the stable state, and then if you change the system away from this uh, stable state, it's going to evolve until it actually comes back to that stable state. This is the kind of behavior that uh, uh, you might have heard of not the, in things like shape memory alloys and so on, where uh, if you twist these things and heat them a bit, they're going to come back to their original shape. There, of course, they're not using magnetism, but the basic idea is the same. There are these stable states which the, mesh, the system remembers because they are minimum energy configurations. If you distort them away from these stable states, it's going to evolve and come back to this stable state. So the Hockfield network is basically analogous to the spin glass. You can see, yes. Guys, what's the question? Um, yeah, I have a question, but are all local minima uh, stable states? Yes. Okay, thank you. Right? So uh, now, uh, uh, so consider the Hockfield network. This Hockfield network is strictly analogous to that spin glass model, right? Which is why we call this, uh, this term the energy. Yes, Stefano? Yeah, question? What, what is the question? Guys, ask a question. I think yeah, you're muted, so unmute yourself. Um, I've already asked the question. It was the one about the local minima. So there was the other one. Uh, there was a second person who had the raised arm raised, or maybe not. So this this thing has this lag, which is a bit annoying. Okay. So now you can see that in the case of the Hopfield network, you have the, the uh, network is behaving exactly like the icing model, and uh, that's why this term is the strictest analog of this energy. It's exactly the same term, right? Uh, which is, it's very anal uh, it's analogous to the spin glass model. And so, and so that's why you, you can think of it as evolving until the energy hits a local minimum. Now, this extra bias term represents an external magnetic field in the uh, icing model. But as far as the neural network is concerned, you can think of it as having a single extra neuron whose value is always pegged to one, right? So for that purpose, in the rest of the explanations in this lecture, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, drop this B every now and then, most of the times, simply because it helps me explain things better. But this B will come back at various points and including in the next lecture. So this is just to, uh, just to make sure that you don't get surprised to see the bias term disappear. So I can write the whole thing like so, without the aid of the external magnetic field. And so the Hopfield network is analogous to the potential energy of the spin glass. I've made one extra change. I've defined the energy energy term like so, where I'm saying I'm summing over all pairs of products, uh, pairs of neurons, but I'm considering each pair only once. In the original definition of the energy, I had uh, sum over all i, j, j not equal to i, which means that you would consider uh, i, j, but you would also consider j, i, right? Instead, I'm saying, some over, uh, some, some over all j, where j is less than i. So this is going to ha have half the number of terms that the previous term had. But because these weights are symmetric, this is exactly half of, uh, this value is half of how we defined the energy earlier. The only reason I'm doing this is to stay consistent with how the energy is defined in the spin glass model. It's not very consequential. It's just a definition. It's a scaling factor of 0.5, okay? Now, so what happens? If I set this network in some configuration, where by configuration I mean I set the output, the values of each of these neurons to, start to either plus one or minus one, right? Then the neuron is going to begin to evolve until it arrives at the local minimum in the energy contour. And there are, and these local minima are stable states, which 
the network remembers. So this actually becomes something wonderful, something that we will call a content addressable memory. How many of you have heard of this term, a content addressable memory? Anybody? I guess not. So uh, now in your standard computer, how do you, if you want to recall something from memory, how do you do it? Anybody want to answer that? Someone, guys? No? Okay. Let me point my finger at someone. Uh, I don't know. Let me just get, leave you guys. Okay. So remember how we actually recall things in uh, a computer. You provide an address, right? So all the things, items that you want to recall sit at some address in your memory. You say, uh, bring me back the value that's stored at address, blah, blah, blah. And the computer is going to go to that address and bring it back. So it's addressed by location. It's location address memory, okay? Here you have something different. Here you have some content that is stored, which is the value at this minimum energy. And now if you want to recall this value, all you have to provide is some degraded version of this value. And from that, it's going to be able to figure out, uh, it's going to be able to e evolve and recall the entire pattern. So it's addressed not by location, but it's actually addressed by content. It's a con content addressable memory, which is fundamentally different from your standard memories and, and has this beautiful property that you can actually uh, recall things based on what you remember of them. It's also called associative memory. So again, here's how the whole thing is going to be behave. You have this network and the network is going to have some uh, energy at each state, where by state, I mean the configuration of these neurons. So if you have uh, uh, this figure is again, only meant to be illustrative. This is in two dimensions. If you have two dimensions, then you can have only four possible states, clearly, right? But in some n-dimensional state, the, uh, n, in n dimensions, you can have two raised to n possible states. And if you start off at some point, the network is going to begin evolving by flipping little bits. But every time it flips a bit, it's going to lower the energy and it's going to continue to evolve until it arrives at a local minimum in the energy contour. And uh, uh, also, we've seen that every change in the network, every flip is going to result in a decrease in the energy. So the path from wherever you initialize the network to the local minimum is going to be monotonic in terms of energy. Now, if you actually uh, look at how the network behaves, every neuron is going to take the value plus one or minus one. So if you have n neurons, then the states that the network can be in are in the corners of an n-dimensional hypercube where, you know, uh, basically the cube which is a hypercube which can take any, uh, where every corner of this hypercube is going to have an n, can, can be represented by an n component vector where every component is plus one or minus one. So in three dimensions, for example, the values that the network can store are going to be one, 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 minus one, one, minus one, one. You can go through the whole, whole range down to minus one, minus one, minus one, right? So you get eight corners to this hypercube. If you have n dimensions, it's going to have the, the state of the network is going to be in the corners of an n dimensional hypercube. That's because we'll use this threshold activation where you're saying that every neuron uh, is going to rest at every neuron, the output of the neuron is going to have either plus one or minus one based on the sign of the field. You can actually change from a threshold activation to other kinds of activations now, like a tan h in which case it's going to be a continuous function. And if it's a continuous function, it means that the state of the neuron is going to live somewhere within this n-dimensional hypercube, but it's not going to go outside this n-dimensional hypercube. Now, uh, I can write this energy in matrix form. If I represent the state of the network as a vector, if I have n neurons, I can have represented as an n-dimensional vector, and every component of this vector is going to be either plus one or minus one, then the energy term that we have over here, which is the sum over all pairs of neurons, 
of the weighted uh, weighted product of their uh, outputs. I can write it like so. It is minus half times the matrix inner product of the state of the network with itself, which is basically y transpose w y, where w is the matrix of weights. Okay, and this term, remember this because we're going to be looking a lot at this matrix w in the next class. Now, this is the energy of the network. And this energy is defined the same way, regardless of whether, whether we use a, uh, use a threshold activation or whether we use a tan H activation. And the evolution of the network is always going to be reducing this energy. Now let's consider a very simple two neuron network. So in this two neuron network, what would this energy contour look like, right? So here is the, the X axis is the output of the first neuron. The y-axis is the output of the second neuron. And basically, uh, at any configuration of this network, I can compute the energy, which is simply minus half y transpose w y, right? So for the example over here, uh, the energy contour looks like so. It's going to have these, these figures you see, they are, uh, they are, uh, le equal value contours, meaning if you go around this particular loop over here, at every position on this loop, the energy of the network remains the same. So also at every position on this inner loop, the energy of the network remains the same. And as you go down, go into towards the centers of these two ellipse, ellip, elliptical shapes, the value of the energy keeps decreasing. And you can see that there are two minima over here, one down here at this bottom left corner, and one up here at this bottom right corner. So if you initialize the network up here, right, where the blue dot is shown, and let this network evolve, this particular network, if you run the simulation, this is how it would evolve. It would sort of swing around, and eventually it's going to settle at this corner. So this point over here is the remembered state, and, it's, and the and network evolves to arrive, arrive at that remembered state. This is for a tan H activation, right? Now, first, there are two minima over here one at the bottom left and one at the top right. So can anybody guess why there are two minima and why, and why not one? Anyone? Yes, Stefano? Um, the energy is a symmetric function. It's a symmetric function, right? So basically, if I replace y by minus y, these two um, my minuses are going to cancel out. Right? So the energy of Y transpose W Y is the same as energy of minus Y transpose W minus Y, which is why if any Y hat is a minimum, so is minus Y hat, okay? Same thing, here is an example of a, a network with three neurons. This has eight possible states, and there are two stable states, one at the top left, one at the bottom right, uh, for the particular configuration. And obviously it needs two states because uh, uh, there are, uh, it's symmetric. And in this case, we are actually considering a threshold activation as shown in the figures. Now this is just for illustration. What I want to show is the, is where this magic actually kicks in, right? Now consider this. Suppose I had a Hopfield network where this Bugs Bunny figure to the left was a stable state. Okay, now if I start with this Bugs Bunny figure and then initialize the Bugs, the Hopfield network with this completely destroyed picture in the middle, it is going to evolve and eventually when it evolves, it's going to end up at the state to the right, which is basically the Bugs Bunny itself. But actually, this is actually from a simulation that I got from uh, this, this, this uh, link at the bottom of the slide. Now, I just picked up the pictures from there. But if you start, at, start with this Bugs, if the network has been designed to remember this Bugs Bunny, and if you initialize it with this guy, it's completely degraded, you've added noise, it's going to reconstruct Bugs Bunny. Or if it uh, has been designed to store Chip and Dale, as it's shown in the, in the bottom left, and now if you initialize the network with just a part of the figure, which means to say that all of the other neurons have been initialized to the same minus one value, right? all of the blacks are plus one, all the other, other neurons are minus one, it's going to evolve and give you back this entire Bugs Bunny, uh, Chip and Dale picture. Now, think over here, how for this, to do this thing on top, how many neurons will this network require? 
Anybody want to take a guess? For this figure, how many neurons will it have? Anyone? Yana? Uh, the dimension of the image? It's the dimension of the image. It's going to have one neuron per pixel, right? So every pixel is being stored at a neuron. This image is the state of the network. And now if I go ahead and degrade it, it's going to evolve and you're going to get back this image. So also with this chip and there, right? This one is a very nice simulation that I actually got uh, off YouTube. Somebody has built a, a little tool to illustrate it. And they stored, okay, let me go back uh, and uh, ex explain again. See this uh, figure, this is the, this is, I'm not sure what it is. I think it's a clown, right? So this person has designed the network to store this clown as a minimum energy configuration. And also this penguin as the minimum energy configuration, the one here, and also this globe as a minimum energy configuration. So there are three minimum energy configurations for this network. And then here's one case where he just corrupted the image, he lets it evolve. It evolves to this guy again. Or oh, see this one, he keeps repeating it, right? He runs different experiments. You can see he starts with this thing, destroys it, and then continues to add some more noise to it, lets it evolve, and gives back the penguin, right? Or if you start from something completely random, it actually gave him the world. And at different on different runs, it gives him different images. It's amazing, right? Uh, it's actually, uh, it is stored, you can see how many uh, evolutions it actually runs down here. So here is this content addressable memory where he has managed to design the network to store three patterns. And then he can start at any point, it's going to recall one of these three patterns, whichever, whichever one is closest. So, yes, Anand? Uh, so the same network has three stable minima states. Is that yeah. the case here? Yeah, the okay. same network is remembering three different patterns. Okay, thank you. Right? So here is the question that all of you guys have been asking. How do I actually evolve the network, right? I can start the network in some initial pattern, and then I can, then I can iterate until convergence. Every neuron is going to be checking the local field and passing it through the activation. You can do this sequentially, go through the neurons one at a time, or you can do them all at once. Just update all the neurons. You know, so in this case, now you're going to have two buffers, one for the current state of the neuron, one for the next state of the neuron, and then you update all the neurons and put them in the next state, flip the buffers, right? So this is like an infinitely deep network with the same weight matrix uh, repeated. But, but it doesn't matter. In all cases, it's going to respond the same way. So. Here's the story so far. A Hopfield network is a loopy binary network with symmetric connections. Given and uh, neurons try to align themselves to the local field caused by other neurons. If you give it an initial configuration, the pattern of net neurons in the net will evolve until the energy achieves a local minimum. And as a result, uh, the network acts as a content addressable memory. If you initialize the network with a somewhat damaged version, of a local minimum pattern, it will it will evolve into that pattern, effectively recalling the correct pattern from a damaged or incomplete version. So far, so good. But then here's the million dollar question. In that example we saw, how did he design the network to store the cartoon, the, the clown, the penguin, and the globe, right? How do you make the network store a specific pattern or set of patterns? How many patterns can we store? He obviously stored three patterns over there, right? And how can you set it up to retrieve these patterns better? So let's consider this first question. How do you make it store a specific pattern or set of patterns? So this is the question again. How do you teach the network to say, remember Chip and Dale? Now for an image with n pixels, so this is probably something like a 300 cross 300, 400 image. So this is, this will need 1.2 million pixels. So for an image with 1.2 million pixels, the neural network would have 1.2 million neurons. Uh, every neuron connects to every other neuron because this is a Hopfield network. The weights matrix is symmetric. It's not mandatory, but we like to deal with symmetric networks because they're easy to analyze. 
which means there are n times n minus one over two weights in all. Actually, it's going to be slightly less because the uh, self connections are all zero, right? Yeah, actually, it's, this is it. It's n times n minus one over two weights, okay? Now, things that we have to remember. A network that stores one pattern also stores its negation. So if this pattern network stores minus one, 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 minus one, one, it's also going to store one, minus one, minus one, one, minus one, as shown over here. Any network that stores a pattern P also stores, naturally stores, stores minus P because as we saw, the energy of a pattern is the same as the energy of the negation of the pattern, right? Uh, now, uh, because a network can store, because the energy contour can have multiple local minima, that means the energy, that means the network can be designed to store multiple patterns. But each of these patterns is in fact going to be stored as two patterns, right? Because every time you store a pattern, there's the stuff on the other side where the state is the exact negation of itself, which is minus P, which is also going to be stored, okay? Now, here is an obvious question, right? What kind of a function is this energy? We've defined it, but what kind of a function is it? Is it linear? Is it exponential? Is it quadratic? What is it? Anyone? Someone's got to have noticed this, right? So how did we define the energy? It's minus of y time, y transpose w y, right? What kind of function is that? Yeah, Ramel? Quadratic. Right, how many minima will it have? Um, it's quadratic. It's two. I mean, like, it depends on number of, uh, uh, I mean, inputs. Basically, the dimension of y. No, y. Wait, wait, wait. It's a quadratic function. It's a convex function, right? So, quadratics are convex. How many of you think a quadratic can have more than one minimum? Anybody? A quadratic cannot have more than one minimum, right? So why does this have multiple minima? Does anybody want to guess? Anyone? Uh, so maybe there's a constraint that uh, there can be multiple local minima. What kind of constraint? Um, the structure of the network, uh, that's a hard No, point. so that's not it, right? Here is the point, the function is a quadratic. The function is a quadratic, it has a unique local minimum when it's convex, right? But the values can only be plus one or minus one. So think of a bowl, okay? In two dimensions, think of a bowl. Now try putting a square on the bowl and you're only reading the values of the bowl at the corners of the square. You will find two different locations. Two of them are going to be, and if the bowl is symmetric, centered at zero, right? Even if it's kind of oblong, you're going to find multiple minima, correct? On the corners of the square. The constraint is that each of the states is going to only be a plus one or minus one. Does that make sense? So, yeah, Kiran? Uh, so I had a few questions. If we move to 10H, then do the number of iterations to converge, is that always going to be less than the number of iterations to converge with the step? Yes, it's actually going to be smoother. So you're going to be, you're going to take a little more time. Ah, okay. So it's all right. Okay. So, but, but, but the whole point is this, the key point is that because of the nature of the constraint, right? You can have, and you're going to, you can, Although the function is a quadratic, you can actually have multiple minima simply because you're not looking at every point of the space to find the minimum. You're only looking at the, at the locations where, uh, at, at only the corners of the cube. So try to visualize this. I'll try to see if I can get a pen to draw this. How does one get a pen? Do you, anybody, does anybody know? Yeah, annotate, right? So let's, there's a, there's, there's a spotlight. Format, eraser, stamp, text, mouse. Let me try this guy, right? So let's say I have, ah, beautiful, right? 
So let's say I have this guy as my uh, bowl. The, those, are, those are all the equal value contours drawn with a mouse. So obviously the minimum is out here, correct? But then I'm only allowed to have, look at these guys, correct? Because I'm not allowed to, because the bits are supposed to be either plus one or minus one. And because I'm only allowed to look at these guys, you're going to find that these two corners are further out from the center than these two corners. You see what I'm drawing, right? So this guy has a higher energy than this guy. This guy has a lower energy than this guy. So these two have higher energy, these two have lower energy. So you have these two corners which have, which are separated from each other, which have lower energy than these two other guys. That makes sense? And so although it's a quadratic with a unique minimum on the corners of this grid, you can have multiple minima. And as you keep increasing the number of dim dimensions, that is going to become worse and worse. So now I have no idea how to get back to my, oh God, I'm screwed. Yeah, Mansi? Yeah, uh, Professor, you just told that after uh, the four corners, two are going to be having same value, two are going to be having different value. But mm -hmm. this entire thing, the bowl that we are talking about is symmetric around origin, right? So aren't they going to be having like, uh, if we take mod of them, aren't they going to be having the like, same values? No, but the, so, so these two guys, so this one is the negation of this one, right? This one is the negation of this one. Okay, so okay. we are not taking mod. So for the state, you're not taking the mod. If you took the mod, then the only thing that remembers it, remains is going to be a plus one or a minus one, correct? Yeah, okay. Right. It's, yeah. I mean, it's going to be all plus ones. The, the, the energy is a quadratic, so the sign goes away. That's all. Okay. You're never taking any mod. It's a completely a linear operation at every point. The only nonlinear operation is, a, is the thresholding. Okay? Okay. Yeah. Now, okay, now, come on, go. I'm not even sure how to make this go away. Okay, so, so here's what we want. We want to design these weights such that the energy is a local minimum at the designed, at the target patterns, okay? And so let's say I want to store one pattern. What I mean, there are two different behaviors, right? I want this pattern to be stationary, which means that for every neuron, the sign of the field must be the same as the sign of the, as the output of the neuron itself. That's when the neuron is not going to flip. None of the neurons are going to flip. So that's a stationary pattern. We are going to do this using very simple Hebbian learning. We are going to say that every weight is simply going to be the product of the two neurons that we're trying to store, okay? So if I'm trying to store a pattern, then the weight that connects neuron i to neuron j is simply going to be the product y i y j. And we can see that this is indeed a, a stable pattern. Now consider the, uh, the sign of, uh, the, of the field at any neuron, right? The sign of the field at any neuron is simply going to be the, the weighted uh, sum of all of the other neurons, w j i times y j right, which is going to be y, the WGI according to Hebbian learning is going to be yi, yi, yj, yi. So it's yj, yi, yj, which is going to be yj squared times yi. This is going to be the field at any neuron, at the ith neuron. If I multiply this by yi, so, so, so uh, the, the, the result is going to be positive. So what you see is that the sign of the field at any neuron is the same as the sign of the neuron itself. So this is the field of the neuron, which is summation over all j not equal to i w j i y j, which is y j y i y j y j squared is going to be plus you know, one because y is at plus one or minus one. That simply and uh, the summation is not over i, so this term goes away. All you're left with is uh, y i. So the sign of this field is simply the sign of y i, which is y i itself, which means that the patterns are stationary. If you, if you use the simple Hebbian learning rule to, to design the network of weights, then if you set the network at the target pattern, it's not going to change. 
but there's something else that also comes in, right? If you actually compute the energy, the energy is going to be the sum over all pairs of neurons of our WJI, YJI, right? But WJI using uh, the Hebbian learning rule is, rule is simply going to be YJ times YI. So this whole thing becomes YI squared, YJ squared, which the, this is one. So this sum is basically going to take the most negative value that it can possibly take. There is no setting of these Ys where the energy is going to be lower than this, which means that the one pattern that you computed these weights from using Hebbian learning, that is going to result in a network for which the lowest energy pattern configuration is that pattern itself or its negation. In other words, not only is the pattern stationary, the pattern is also stable. Meaning if you start at that pattern and then you change any of the bits, it's going to begin evolving and come back to that pattern because that pattern is guaranteed, not just to be on a flat region of the energy contour, but it's actually guaranteed to be the value of an energy contour, right? So uh, I'm going to show, uh, try to visualize this. This figure is like a Carnot map. Here I have a four bit network. So in a Carnot map, you're familiar with Carnot map from lecture two, right? So the top row connects to the bottom row, the right column connects to the left column, right? And each cell, each cell represents one bit pattern. I would like to store this bit pattern, which is one minus one, one, one. I use Hebbian learning to set the weights for this bit pattern. And then when I compute the energy at the various configurations, you see this is what the energy looks like. Yellow is lowest, blue is highest. And you can see that regardless of where you begin, it's going to begin to evolve. If the, if the neighboring network has a neighboring cell as a lower energy, it's going to move into it, right? So from here, it's going to move here and here, or it's going to move from down here and then to this thing. So regardless of where you start from, the network will evolve into one of these two yellow patterns, which are the patterns that you're trying to remember. So uh, this actually works. But that works if you're trying to store only one pattern. If you want to store more than one pattern, what do you do? You're still going to use the same Hebbian learning rule, except that you're going to be computing the weights for each ideal weights for each of the patterns and then summing them all up. So you'd be summing this product over all of the patterns that you're trying to store. Okay. So when you do this, how many patterns can you store? Uh, it's unclear exactly how many patterns you can store, but under some conditions, you can show that if you have some bounds on the error probability for an N neuron network, you can store up to 0.15 N patterns through heavy and learning, right? Where did this number come from? It's very easy to see where the 0.15 N came, came from, right? So again, here is the, how we set the weights. Suppose you have K patterns you're trying to store, correct? I'm going to set the weights. The, so this guy is the uh, Hebbian learned weight for the kth pattern. I'm summing over all the patterns I'm trying to store. And just for mathematical convenience, I'm going to divide by the number of bits. So this is the normalized weight. This guy doesn't really change the, the behavior of the network, right? So now for any pattern to be stable, you want the product of the value of any bit and the, and the field at that bit to be greater than zero. And the field at that bit, if WIJ is set using this, this rule over here is going to be uh, one over N, the sum over all of the patterns, right? Of YI times YJ, that's what WIJ is. WIJ is sum over all the patterns of YI times YJ. And this guy, you're going to be multiplying with the jth neuron output and summing over all of the neurons. This, you know, the when I explain it in words, maybe it's not very intuitive, but the math is very clear. This term, the, the term to the left must be positive for, for a neuron to be stable, for it to not flip its sign, right? So here is this term again. This term must be stable, uh, there must be positive for the neuron to not flip its sign. Now, if you look at this weights, these weights had two components. There was the component that came from the pattern itself that you're trying to recall. And then you had the other component which came from other patterns. The contribution of the, so if I'm trying to recall, for example, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, clown in the, in, the, in the video that we saw. 
So these weights are going to be the sum over three, three patterns. It's going to be the sum over the clown, the penguin, and the world, right? Now, if I'm trying to recall the clown, then this guy is the, these are the clown bits. Anything with the superscript P is the clown bits. I can separate these weights into the contribution of the clown and the contribution of the other two figures, the penguin and the world, right? Now we are guaranteed that, that this term, this term to the left, is not only going to be positive, it's actually going to be one because I have this one over n term outside. Because observe this, this is yip times yip, that's simply going to be one. yjp times yjp is also going to be one. It's a sum of n terms divided by n. This first term is simply going to be one. This second term, we really don't know what it's going to be, right? But we know this, that for this pattern to be stable, this overall term has to be positive. And because this first guy is one, you want the second term to be greater than minus one. Only then this overall sum is going to be positive, right? And so the second term is what we will call the crosstalk. The pattern will fail to be stored stably if this crosstalk term is less than minus one for any, any neuron, okay? And here's where some fancy math comes in. We don't really need to get into it, but you can actually uh, approximate this whole, this sum as a Gaussian, the, the distribution of the sum as a Gaussian. And if you assume that the patterns that you're trying to store were randomly drawn by flipping a coin, then so under that assumption, if the patterns are randomly drawn flipping a coin, then you can show that, uh, if, that if the number of pattern, the ratio of the number of patterns, which is key, to the number of bits n is less than 0.14, then there's a probability of less than 0 0.004, which is less than 0.4%, that the pattern will not be stable. That, in other words, that the crosstalk term is going to be less than minus one for some bit. So the actual math is not relevant. The point is that if you just use the simple Hebbian, uh, uh, this Hebbian rule and average over all the patterns, and if the patterns that you're trying to store are random, then for a thousand bits, you can store up to uh, 0.1515 times thousand, which is like, uh, how much, 15 bits, right? And for 100 bits, you can store up to 15 patterns. So, so a network of n neurons trained by Hebbian learning can store up to 0.14 n patterns with low probability of error. Again, it's not very low, right? Because 0 0.004 is pretty, actually a pretty high probability of error. It means that out of every thousand patterns that you store, four of them are going to be stored badly, even under this condition. Still, if you think of those as, low, as a low probability of error, uh, the, uh, you can store up to 0.14 n random patterns, okay? But what if it's not random? What if the patterns are not random? Now, what do I mean by saying random patterns? In a random pattern, the number of bits that are plus one will be the same on average as the number of bits that are minus one, right? So if I take any two of these patterns that I'm trying to store, each of them being random, then if I take a pairwise product of the bits for these two, for these two patterns, even for the pairwise product, because the uh, bits are random, the product is going to be plus one on average for half the bits, and minus one on average for the remaining half. In other words, the inner product between these two bit patterns is going to be zero. The patterns are going to be orthogonal. Now, what happens if you have non-orthogonal patterns? Let's take a look. So first, uh, here is this thing. Orthogonal patterns are the maximum distance from one another when you have binary patterns in the sense that if I have two patterns that are orthogonal from one another, if they are n bit patterns, then they differ from each other in n over two bits. And you cannot have two bits, two patterns that differ in more than n over two bits for the same reason, for the reason that, you know, a pattern and its negation, as far as we are concerned, are the same, right? So the maximum distance between two patterns is n over two. And so we see that we can store up to 0.14 n orthogonal patterns. If I make the patterns non-orthogonal, intuition would tell you that you're going to be able to store fewer patterns because they begin to get closer to each other, right? Orthogonal patterns, if you think of the hypercube, 
they are farthest apart. They are in the corners that are farthest apart. What happens when you bring the patterns closer together? You expect that you can store fewer of them, but that's not really what happens. Uh, so here's what we saw earlier. When I'm trying to store one pattern, here is the energy configuration, and you can see that that pattern and its negation are in the energy well, right? Now, if I've got the maximum Hamming distance between two n-bit patterns is n over two, because for any pattern y equals minus y, two patterns y1 and y2 that are different n over two bits are all, again, conversely, they are orthogonal because their inner product is zero. And we also have this behavior that for if the number of bits can be written as some two raised to m times l, well, l is where l is an odd number, you can find at most two raised to m orthogonal binary patterns. Others may be almost orthogonal, but they won't be exactly orthogonal. Now, this is just the math of it, but let's go back to the uh, to what happens. Uh, here I have, again, I'm trying, this is a four bit network. I'm trying to store these two patterns. And these two patterns have been chosen to be orthogonal. If you look at the energy contour, right, you can see that those patterns are indeed stable. A pattern will be stable if it's a local minimum in the energy contour, which means that the color must be as yellow as possible. So the patterns are stable. They're also stationary in the sense that if you go from a pattern and flip a bit, there's a 50% probability that it's going to come back to that pattern. But then it's kind of noisy because there's also a 50% probability that it's going to go to the other pattern. Okay, so they're perfectly confusable for recall. But then suppose I give you non-orthogonal patterns. I have these two patterns which are non-orthogonal. If you look at the energy contour, you get this beautiful picture where they, those patterns and their neighbors are the only uh, energy minima. And if you start at any of the other patterns, it's going to flip into one of these two patterns, whichever is closer. So here, although the patterns are, uh, I have only four bits. So 0.14n is much less than two, but I'm actually able to store two patterns because they are not orthogonal. Now, the, 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 the math for why this is so, we can work out, I won't spend time on it, but it turns out that when the patterns are actually correlated with one another, when they're not orthogonal, you can store more than 0.14 n patterns. Let's look at some more examples. Here, for example, I'm trying to store uh, three orthogonal four-bit patterns. And once again, you can see that all three patterns are stationary because they are valleys in the energy contour but they are not stable in the sense that if I perturb it from one of these guys, it may end up in one of the other patterns, right? Uh, but these are three orthogonal patterns. But if I have three uh, non-orthogonal patterns, in this case, you see one of them actually has a pretty strong value and, it, uh, uh, and this guy ends up grabbing all of the uh, memory, right? So you get similar patterns for behaviors for other kinds of uh, combinations. Here I'm trying to store four orthogonal four-bit patterns and the energy contour is flat. They're all the same, okay? In terms of total wipeout. But there's something more interesting that happens, right? Uh, let's keep going ahead and see how many patterns we can store and what happens, right? Now, Hopfield said for a network of N neurons, you can store up to 0.14 N random patterns. And when I say store first, the first thing you realize is that it's a fuzzy statement. When I say store, am I speaking of a stable pattern where if I'm in that configuration, it's going to stay there and not going to evolve? Or I mean, do I mean a stationary pattern where if I'm in the pattern, it's not going to evolve? Or do I mean stable where if I start from the pattern and flip a bit, it's going to come back to that pattern? Both of them, I mean, so saying store doesn't tell you by itself is not very clear. It doesn't tell you whether you're looking for stationarity or also stability. Intuitively, you want things to be stable, not merely stationary, right? Uh, now, with the n into n equals four, the visualization was kind of bad. To get a better idea, let's take a look at, say, uh, six-bit patterns. Again, I'm drawing, I'm drawing something like a, a Carnot map for six bits. If I try to store one pattern, you can see that it's a local minimum. Beautiful. If I try to store two orthogonal patterns, it's also a local minimum, but then something interesting happens over here, right? Let's consider this guy, this 
uh, this pattern that I'm showing with the mouse. This pattern has some energy, right? If you look at all of the neighboring uh, states, the neighboring states either have the same energy or have higher energy. So in other words, this guy is actually stable even though it's not a pattern that you're trying to remember. In fact, it's not only stable. If you started in this state immediately to the right, the system is going to evolve. The, the network is going to evolve into this state. It actually is a local minimum. It's a fake memory. It's a pattern that you are not trying to remember, but the network sort of, when you, when you designed the network using heavy and learning, it not only learned to remember the patterns you were trying to store it, ended up remembering some other patterns. Uh, we have several different examples of this kind. And then every kind, if you go through the slides uh, with six bits and eight bits, here is something that you, here's something that you find that A, uh, first, if the patterns are not random, you can actually store more than 0.14n patterns, but then you also have these parasitic patterns patterns that you're not trying to remember that also become stable or attractors, which have minimum energy, right? And why do we have these parasitic patterns? Parasitic patterns can end up being other undesired local minima in your energy contour, like these guys. So these are the patterns in this example that I'm trying to store. But when you, design, when you design the weights using heavy and learning, these guys became local minima. And so if you start off in the vicinity of these guys into, instead of evolving into one of the memories, it's going to evolve into this local minima, which is really what, what you, not something that you want. And that has to do with the fact that, uh, that when you're using heavy and learning, then any linear combination of the patterns that you're trying to store also ends up becoming a, becoming a parasitic pattern because you can show that the energy over there is a, uh, is a, uh, local minimum, right? So in terms of capacity, it seems that it's possible to store more than 0.14 n patterns in the network. In other words, you can obtain a weights matrix such that the number of patterns stored is greater than 0.14 n. That is, you can make uh, more than 0.14 n patterns at least one bit stable. What I mean by one bit stable is that you can flip up to one bit and it will come back to that pattern. Uh, but then for this to happen, those patterns must be non-orthogonal, right? But you, can't be, but you also come with the cost, comes at the cost of having lots of spurious memories. So the question is, can, you know, and this is all using heavy and learning. Everything that we've spoken so far is using heavy and learning to get the wits. So the question is, can we attempt to get greater control on the process than what simple heavy and learning gives us? And this is what we're going to look at. So the story so far, a Hopfield network is a loopy binary network with symmetric connections. Given an initial configuration, the pattern of neurons will evolve until the energy achieves a local minimum. The network must be designed to store the des desired memories. And memory patterns can be stationary, but ideally they must also be stable on the energy contour. The network can be trained by heavy and learning, which guarantees that you can store up to 0.14 n random patterns with less than 0.4% probability of error. But empirically, we've seen from the figures that we may be able to store more than 0.14 n patterns uh, if they're not random, right? So based on these, I'm going to make a bold claim. A, that I can always store up to n orthogonal patterns if they are stationary, not just 0.14 n, but n orthogonal patterns such that they are stationary. And uh, I can avoid spurious memories by adding some noise during recall. And, and in fact, with some minor modification, you can store more than n patterns. And how these are going to, this is going to be done, we will cover in the next class. So I'll stop right here. Uh, and we have maybe a minute or two for questions. If you have any questions, I can answer them or we'll continue on Wednesday, right? So on Monday, okay, Anna, what's the question? Yes, so when you're storing multiple patterns, uh, like how you described it in slide 92, yeah, uh, mm -hmm. 93, yeah, this one, 92. Mm -hmm. So let's say we are at the spurious memory, like parasitic memory two, 
mm-hmm. and like if there was a mem- uh, like a parasitic memory but just like a regular curve do we know how the network uh, decides to go whether on the left or on the right so we don't because there so if you for example if you are at this peak right yes so that's going to go down here or down here is going to depend on the order in which the the you the uh, bits flip and we and this is a very complex surface you can only make statistical statements about you know whether there are parasitic memories and how i can try to minimize them you can't really uh, it's very hard to uh, uh, to guess which way they're going it's going to go okay okay it's actually uh, because again this this, this is a you know, you're working on integer surfaces right so oh. these are extremely complex problems okay well, thank you anyone else yeah okay all right okay guys thank you i'll post these slides uh the, the, the video on the web in as soon as i get it see you on monday thank you